Good evening. I'm Mike Perrin, the Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, uh, the support group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center located here at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Tonight, we're pleased to have a very special guest, uh, David Schwinn, who is a Navy officer, a retired Navy officer, and has served in assignments in Japan, Maryland, and Virginia. He earned a bachelor's degree from Regents College, State University of New York, and holds a master's degree from the National Postgraduate School and the Navy War College. He's been a military historian and researcher for more than 25 years, specializing in the study of specific veterans and their roles in the important military events of the First and Second War. His specializations include research of World War II Soviet veterans, as well as American Army and Navy veterans of both World War I and World War II. He has assisted council researchers and veterans' families in finding the military and service uh, history of former military personnel and their family members. Now I just have to get them onto the screen. There we go. Okay. We All go. right. Okay, David, the floor is now yours on a very unique topic. All right. Well, first off, let's go ahead and uh, share this screen. Let's hope that this, there we, okay. There we go. All right, can everyone see the screen now? All right, well, uh, welcome to my uh, webinar about posthumous awards of the Purple Heart Medal in the Second World War. I've uh, <clears throat> named this webinar after my book that was released earlier this year entitled Sacrifice Remembered. Further details about the book can be found at the end of the presentation. My background is being an active duty military officer, but I've spent the last uh, has already been discussed, but I've uh, spent the last 33 years studying the physical aspects of military history, such as uniforms, documents, and medals. I wrote a book released in 2015 that told the story of the 217 U.S. Navy uh, Merchant Marine and Coast Guard recipients of Soviet medals, and uh, that was published by Schiffer Publishing. And once that book was published, I felt a book that really captured the sacrifice and loss that Purple Heart represents would not only be a challenging project, but most importantly, bring light to stories of sacrifice that in many cases have been forgotten. I'm lucky enough to be joined by today by two of the nation's experts on the Purple Heart. I have uh, Frank Smith with me, who was a major contributor to my book, uh, as well as one of the original um, researchers into the Purple Heart and the different variations and engraving styles and uh, Army Major and Dr. Kyle Hatzinger, who conducted extensive research at the National Archives about the Purple Heart and the casualty process. In fact, he's, uh, he included those uh, considerably in his doctorate program. Both of them con uh, contributed extensively to my book and are here to answer any questions at the uh, end of the webinar that fall into their area of expertise. This webinar is gonna start with a history of the Purple Heart, how it came to being, and then how it changed over time to represent our nation's symbol of ultimate sacrifice. I'm gonna tell you about some of the uh, recipients of Purple Heart medals and a sacrifice they made for our country. My goal is this, when you're done with this webinar, you'll be able to better appreciate the story behind the medal and you'll know that it's not just a piece of fabric and a bit of metal, but a physical reminder of a service member's sacrifice. That's the point I wanna drive home. Without further ado, Let's start with some history. Most people are familiar with the story of George Washington establishing the award of the Badge of Military Merit on August 7th, 1782. This badge, a purple heart-shaped patch, was awarded three times for gallantry. This one, here photographed here, is on display at the National Purple Heart Hall of Honor in Newburgh, New York. Following the end of the revolution, this badge is an award was essentially all but forgotten about. The Civil War precipitated the creation of the Medal of Honor, which became the sole award available to decorate people for heroism demonstrated in battle. And this particular Medal of Honor from the Army was posthumously awarded to Marine Corporal John Pruitt for extraordinary gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty while serving with the Army's second division in action at Blancmont Ridge on October, 1918. Corporal Pruitt single-handedly attacked two machine guns, capturing them and killing two of the enemy. He then captured 40 prisoners in a dugout nearby, but was killed soon afterwards. So this Medal of Honor was awarded posthumously. 
Another award that was able to be awarded posthumously was uh, the Army's Distinguished Service Cross and its counterpart, the Navy Cross. Uh, this particular Distinguished Service Cross, serial numbered 17 on the side of the cross, as you can see in this photo, was awarded to Frank Gordon of the 26th Division. He earned this medal on April 20th, 1918 for rescuing a fellow soldier in France who had both his legs lost by shell fire. Carrying the wounded man back to American lines, the pair were hit by another artillery shell, killing them both instantly. Gordon's father, who lived in Ennis, Ireland, accepted the award on his behalf. As the Purple Heart would not come into existence for another 14 years, awards like this Medal of Honor to Corporal Pruitt and the uh, Distinguished Service Cross to uh, Corporal Gordon were really the only award that was available to uh, reward these men for their heroism. Uh, for those who were simply killed in battle, there was really nothing to reward them with or give them uh, in the end. Many of the service members were, who were killed in action, they re received nothing at all. And uh, their final deeds, as their final deeds, really didn't match the uh, stringent requirements of the awards for heroism, either the Distinguished Service Cross, the Navy Cross, or the Medal of Honor. So what... Uh, the Army decided to uh, come up with uh, during the, the end of the First World War was for those who were killed or wounded in action, they received a large format document. It was called the Columbia Accolade. And depending on if they were killed or only wounded, the, uh, the wording varied slightly on the document. Uh, but the image of Columbia and the soldier who was kneeling uh, remained the same. This particular accolade that's uh, pictured here uh, in the webinar was earned by Howard Wilmot of Michigan, a private serving with the 325th Auxiliary Remount Depot. He died from disease on February 28, 1919, having never served overseas. So at this point in time, the only other award that could be bestowed on a service member was his document for wounds or death in the line of duty. And instead of a metal ribbon denoting uh, wounds received in action, <clears throat> soldiers were authorized to wear chevrons on their right cuffs. Uh, this particular soldier, uh, whose uh, group of uniforms is photographed here, his name was Wagoner Charles Light of the 26th Division, and he was wounded twice during the war, as can be seen by the two chevrons on the right cuff of his overcoat. Those on his left cuff, the three of them, indicate a year and a half of overseas service, very similar to the uh, service stripes worn on today's Army uniforms. With that background, two, two problems are really identified. Uh, first, there was no other awards available to reward meritorious service, aside from the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross, and the Navy Cross, and then the Army and the Navy uh, Distinguished Service Medals, which were typically reserved for senior officers. General Pershing had been made aware of this issue, and upon recommendation of his staff, created the Meritorious Service Citation Certificate, also called the MSCC, which one of which is photographed here. This particular one was awarded to Sergeant First Class Ross Rader, who was a railway engineer with the 59th Company Transportation Corps at the important logistics port, port of Brest. While this award was a step in the right direction for recognizing meritorious performance, it was still lacking as an actual decoration, as it was simply, just as you see, an actual piece of paper. On a side note, once the Purple Heart was created, those who'd received this MSCC could exchange their paper certificates for a Purple Heart medal. The MSCC Purple Hearts, as they are known, were awarded all the way through the beginning of the Second World War. In fact, there were 270 of them awarded prior to the termination of awarding the Purple Hearts for meritorious service in the Second World War. Most of these, if not all, were converted to Bronze Stars later on in the war when the Bronze Star was uh, initially fielded. Back to Purple Hearts, though. With the end of the First World War, discussions continued about creating what was being called a quote-unquote third decoration something that could be used in addition to the Distinguished Service Cross and the Medal of Honor to denote meritorious service and also for wounds received in action. Do know that this was an Army only award at the time. The uh, Navy <clears throat> did not see or need uh, or feel the need for a, a third decoration and they were content uh, to carry on with the Navy Cross as well as the Distinguished Service Medal. Um, and the Navy, honestly, would only adopt the Purple Heart with the beginning of the Second World War. I'm getting a little ahead of myself at this point, though. So let's get back to uh, the Purple Heart. While discussions were, hurt, were had about the third decoration, they were lost in the world of post-war bureaucracy of the 1920s and the Great Depression. 
and uh, other things that were happening at that time. The idea was championed by more than a few officers and generals over the course of the next decade, uh, but really it never gained the traction that it needed until MacArthur, General MacArthur, became the Chief of Staff of the Army. With MacArthur's help, the idea for the third decoration was re-energized, and he uh, promoted it extensively. So for the first time, he was successful in obtaining the authorization for the third decoration. And at that point, then came the question, what was it going to look like? What was it going to be called? You know, what, what actual format would this third decoration take? And this is when they reached back into history and adopted what became known as the Purple Heart. So this particular Purple Heart <clears throat> is of the initial contract of Purple Hearts that were awarded uh, initially in 1932. So in the 200 anniversary of George Washington's birth, which was February 22nd, 1932, the Purple Heart, as it was now known, um, even though it does still say, keeps the words for military merit on the, on the reverse, uh, became reality for the Army uh, under War Department General Order Number 3. And one of the requirements of this new medal was that it would be serial numbered. So General MacArthur, as is probably not surprising to most people, received serial number one. And as a side note, just for, uh, just for people's knowledge, all uh, war departments, so all Army awards, were required to be serial numbered up until 1943. So awards of the Purple Heart numbered all the way up into the 600,000 range have been seen. And in fact, Here's an example of a uh, award of the Purple Heart <clears> that the numbering on the side. This one in particular is uh, 483313. They're often kind of difficult to, to actually see without either a loop or really close up photograph. So this new medal, the Purple Heart, was designed specifically for recognition not only of a special especially meritorious service, but also for wounds received in action, going all the way back to the Civil War. So people who were wounded in the Civil War that were still alive in 1932 could actually apply for this medal. And that also included veterans of Puerto Rico, uh, of the Indian Wars, et cetera, that had been wounded uh, during the, the course of those campaigns. Keep in mind that at this time, it was only, this was the only medal was, or the medal was still only for the Army and those that served under Army's command, like uh, Victor Bleasdale, whose medal is photographed here, a Marine officer who has earned two Silver Stars, the Navy Cross and the Single Service Cross, extremely heroic, uh, while serving with the Army's second division during World War I. This Purple Heart uh, is an early 1932 production Purple Heart and is the, in the collection of the National Museum of the Marine Corps. I've used this one as an example, uh, particularly because of the fact of just the condition and just showing essentially what how he received it originally in 1932. So this webinar um, is about posthumous awards of the Purple Heart, so awards that were made once someone was killed in action. And up to this point, they were not authorized for posthumous presentation. In fact, General MacArthur was vehemently against the awarding of the Purple Heart posthumously. In the quote on this slide, which he made during a radio address on June 27, 1938, he made his thoughts plainly known. And it's very clear when you read the quote. Um, it was only the Second World War that brought about a change in policy, leading to the Purple Heart becoming the symbol of sacrifice, and for many, the ultimate sacrifice. So on December 7, 1941, Japan attacked US forces in the Pacific. And I use that as a broad geographic term, as a Japanese attack not only Pearl Harbor, but within hours, multiple other U.S. facilities across the Pacific. The Second World War had officially begun for the United States. Four months later, on April 28, 1942, the Purple Heart was authorized for posthumous awarding. And even then, it was only retroactive to December 7, 1941. Further, it was only authorized for members of the Army and the Army Air Force. On Finally, on December 3rd, 1942, almost a full year after the attack of Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9277, permitting the award of the Purple Heart to the other services, retroactive to December 6th, 1941. So when you think about it, we had been at war for literally almost a year at this point before all of the branches of the service authorized the posthumous awarding of the Purple Heart, something that today 
in, in our day and age would be simply unfathomable. Additionally, for those casualties of en enemy action that uh, took place prior to December 6, 1941, such as the 116 sailors that were lost during the torpedo of the USS Reuben James on October 31st, 1941, there and next to kin and their families had to apply for their Purple Hearts, their posthumous Purple Hearts, individually. And uh, as you can imagine, having to do that, getting the word out to all those families, having them apply individually to the chief of naval personnel, made the awarding of those posthumous Purple Hearts very uneven. So during the course of the Second World War, from, from December 7th, 1941, through September 2nd, 1945, the United States lost a total of 407,316 personnel to all causes. So almost, almost a half a million, with the loss of 291,577 men and women from direct combat. The combat-related losses for the Army, which included the, uh, the Army Air Force at the time, <clears throat> contributed the greatest number of 234,874. The Navy's losses were 36,376, and the Marine Corps losses were 19,733. Finally, the Coast Guard lost a total of 574 personnel due to enemy action during the war. So represented here are Purple Hearts from each service branch. And you'll note that there's only one representative from the Army because the Army and the Army Air Force had the, uh, the same War Department Purple Hearts. So to talk a little bit about each one of these very briefly, uh, because just keep in mind, every time you see a Purple Heart in this presentation, it's not just a medal or a piece of fabric, but it really denotes the ultimate sacrifice that someone made for our country, as well as just a tremendous loss and a tremendous grief experienced by one family. Just the, the idea, being able to put that in words is even difficult. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, Seaman First Class Rupert Claire Gove was from Humboldt, California, and he joined the Navy on July 30th, 1940. Just over two months later, he reported to the USS Arizona, where he died on December 7, 1941. John DeRose, who was representing the Army, was born in Massachusetts and enlisted in the Army on May 20th, 1942. He was part of Battery A of the 977th Field Artillery Battalion. They had fought at Anzio in the famed battle there in Italy. And on August 15, 1944, uh, during uh, Operation Dragoon, which was the invasion of the southern coast of France, they were about to land on Green Beach when their ship, LST-282, was struck by a German glider bomb. 21 of Battery A, to include John Jarrows, were killed in that action. In the lower left corner, motor machinist mate John Stanley Meisnikowski, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and I'm truly sorry about that, enlisted in the Coast Guard on February 18, 1941. He eventually joined the crew of the USS Leopold. He had been on board for just under four months when the ship was torpedoed. He was from Manhattan, New York, and had worked as a uh, tractor operator for a cemetery outside of Manhattan. After enlisting, he married a young lady from Ohio, and she was pregnant when his ship was torpedoed on March 9, 1944. Just a week later, she had a son who uh, would never know his father. In the lower right corner, Private Otto Newberry Boxley worked as a farmhand and a truck driver in Kaw, Oklahoma. He joined the Marine Corps on May 6, 1944, and landed in Okinawa on April 1, 1945. He was killed about two months later on June 7, 1945, by Japanese machine gun fire. Otto Boxley left behind a widow and also a young son. At that time, he was 28 years old. And here I'd just like to, uh, to pause and say these are just a handful of the nearly 2,000 Purple Hearts that I photographed in the uh, compiling and writing of my book, Sacrifice Remembered. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't in include them all, uh, which has been very difficult and taken up a vast amount of space, especially with the biography of, uh, of each re recipient. But it was, and trying to, to determine who I should and should not include was extremely difficult because, as I've said before, each one of these represents a tremendous loss and the life of a, of, of a person. Um, so I did what 
basically what I could do. And I did my very best to research and record the histories of those who I did uh, include in the book in order to really honor the sacrifice that they made for their country. So what we're gonna do, and since I only have an hour for this webinar, I've selected a handful of uh, Purple Hearts and uh, from each of the branches of the service. And we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth about who these guys were and what they did for their country and how they lost their lives and how, what they did to really, to earn a uh, Purple Heart. So first up is Ira Boswell Cheney, who is from El Monte, California. Is actually really close to my hometown. Um, he uh, graduated from South Pasadena High School and attended Pasadena City College before attending West Point, graduating with the class of 1941. He was married for only a few short months and uh, before he shipped out for Manila, where a lot of his classmates were headed uh, in the early part of the, 19, of the 1940s and even in the late 30s. Uh, he was a rifle platoon leader with the Philippine Division when the Japanese attacked, and he was killed in action near Abuke uh, Bataan on January 30th, 1942. <clears throat> and there's a photo of uh, Lieutenant Cheney, and he earned the Distinguished Service Cross two weeks before he was killed in action. It's probably fairly doubtful that he even knew that he earned the Distinguished Service Cross, as both of them were awarded posthumously to his widow. I've uh, included close-ups of the engraving from the back of both his Purple Heart that's on top and the Distinguished Service Cross on the bottom. And I'd just like to note here <clears throat> that all of these awards for the War Department were engraved by the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot in Philadelphia. Uh, they were, and this is for both the Army and the Army Air Force, and at that point then, then they were sent out to the families. And and another thing I'd like to note is that the Purple Heart was actually mailed directly to the families after uh, it was engraved at the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot, whereas other awards, such as awards for posthumous awards for valor, like his uh, Distinguished Service Cross, et cetera, would be awarded in a presentation ceremony at the family's wishes. Sometimes they didn't want to have a ceremony, sometimes they did. And the Army was actually very good at the time in abiding by those wishes. So they were sent in a box, very much like this one. Um, and uh, this is what the families received, uh, somewhat, I'd say, a little, probably a little unceremoniously, but this is how they received the Purple Hearts during the Second World War, for the entire Second World War. Inside that cardboard box was a, what we call a, a coffin box, <clears throat> which is called a, a coffin case more in the, just from the style of the case, rather than actually it being awarded posthumously. So this is what it would look like when a family would open up the award uh, with the ribbon bar, a couple lengths of ribbon, the medal itself, and a lapel pin. Uh, the appearance of the Navy ones uh, awarded by the Navy Department, so for the Navy and the Marine Corps and also for the Coast Guard, were slightly different, but that's kind of outside the scope of this webinar, and I only have an hour. So I'd like to cover a few more, a few more recipients. Next up, we're going to talk about... Uh, uh, another story that's really, really touching. Um, Dr. John Plain, he was a doctor in Ransomville, New York, and he actually lost three sons during the war, although only two of them were his biological sons. <clears throat> the first died in a stateside plane crash in August 1942, and his next son, uh, serving in North Africa, was killed in January of 1943. He had a third son, but he wasn't really his biological son, even though he was raised in the family and raised with who he considered his own brothers. And a little history on the relationship between Dr. Plain and Raymond Smithson, whose Purple Heart you see here in his picture. Their, uh, their story goes back to October 1913, when uh, there was a horrible railway accident of a buggy that was hit by an oncoming train. Uh, in the midst of this accident, Dr. Plain was the responding doctor and uh, at the at the site at the scene um, it was determined that uh, Raymond's mother had passed away and it wasn't until sometime later that they actually noticed a bundle um, that had been dropped from the buggy in between the tracks and inside that bundle was a live baby boy named Raymond Smithson. Due to the injuries sustained in this uh, accident 
uh, Raymond's father uh, passed away soon thereafter, and he was raised by his aunts and uncles. He had a fairly normal uh, growing up. <clears throat> um, he attended, uh, went to Niagara Falls High School in Niagara Falls, and uh, he also went to Niagara University, and he was employed by the Electro-Metallurgical Company, uh, and up until 1942, when he too decided to join the Army, just like his brothers. Uh, he volunteered for the uh, paratroops, and he served uh, valiantly in combat, uh, both in Sicily and in Italy uh, with D Company of the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. Um, he actually survived the initial jump into Normandy on D-Day on June 6, 1944, but was sadly killed on uh, about two weeks later on June 21st, 1944, while fighting in France. So I want to include uh, probably some of the, one of the more poignant things that uh, people encounter when they encounter a posthumous Purple Heart, and this is the Western Union Telegram. And uh, as you can read on the, on the screen, basically Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your nephew, Corporal Raymond D. Smithson, was killed in action on 21 June in France. And this was dated uh, only about a month later, which was fairly remarkably quick at the time. We'll actually discuss these a little bit later on in, in more detail. Now, a few more pictures uh, later on in the webinar of how these actually came to be. One of the other things that uh, is found from time to time are return to sender uh, envelopes or return to sender mail. As you can see on this one, those return to sender, it is stamped deceased on the front. Um, something that's very touching. In fact, there were quite a few times where moms, widows, fathers, uh, other siblings kept writing to their soldiers who were either missing in action or had, they didn't notify that they were killed in action just on an off chance that there might be a way that maybe they weren't dead and, ma and maybe they were actually receiving their letters. So sometimes you'll see bundles of these letters and it's really it brings a tear to your eye because they they still held on to that hope that their their loved one was still alive. It's very 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 touching. Uh, frequently encountered as well as this was required by the War Department was a letter uh, from the unit commander uh, to the next of kin. And in this case, the unit commander was General Ridgeway, who's a fairly well known commander uh, who commanded the 82nd Airborne. And this is to Mr. Schultz, uh, who is the uncle of Raymond Smithson, and it talks about how he performed and how he was well-liked uh, within, uh, within the unit. So in addition to the Purple Heart, uh, the next of kin received, obviously there was a telegram notifying them of the, the death or whatever the status was, uh, missing in action, et cetera. Um, and then a letter from the unit commander, but then in addition to the Purple Heart, they received a uh, full color certificate. It was a fairly large format document. It was really beautifully done with an embossed purple heart and ribbon on it, uh, signed by the Secretary of War. Um, and this would, this one in particular was printed up about three months after he was killed in action. One of the other things that was received by <clears throat> families that, of anyone, uh, anywhere in the world, whether they were stationed in the States or stationed overseas, whether it was a combat casualty or they died of tuberculosis in a hospital, everyone who died during the war, so all 400,000 plus, um, their next of kin received what they call the presidential accolade. And this was a very large format document that was normally mailed in a tube mailer. And uh, this one notes that he was killed in the European area. And we'll see a few others uh, later on in this presentation that are a little bit more exacting as far as where they died. Because whether it was a war department or the Navy department depended on uh, what they put on the uh, accolade from the president. Next up, we're going to talk about another uh, casualty and who's represented here who had, you know, really this is a tremendously uh, poignant story that I think just from the picture, a lot of people who are watching this webinar uh, already know what I'm talking about. And this is about the crew of the Lady Be Good. Uh, she left on her first flight 
and out, out of Saluch airfield on the coast of Libya. And uh, she was serving with the 514th Bombard Bombardment Squadron, 376 Bomb Group. And this is her first flight on April 4th, 1943. <clears throat> they left on an afternoon attack uh, on the harbor at Naples. And there were 25 aircraft that left in two waves in the raid, with the Lady Be Good being flown by First Lieutenant William J. Hatton as the pilot, uh, departing the airfield at 2.15. Well, there was a large dust storm, uh, that unexpected, that basically sent eight of the 12 aircraft from the first wave back. The Lady Be Good and four others, uh, I'm sorry, from the second wave back to the uh, air base. The Lady Be Good and four others continued on to Naples, but upon their arrival, they discovered heavy anti-aircraft fire. And uh, so two of the aircraft attacked their secondary target, two of the aircraft jettisoned their bombs, and all the aircraft headed back to Saluk, Libya. Well, so they're still airborne just after midnight. So keep in mind that they actually took off at 2.15. So right now they've been in the plane flying uh, without refueling, as they couldn't refuel at the time, uh, for about 10 hours. And uh, Lieutenant Hatton radioed the base, and the base received a, a call from him saying that his direction finder was not operational. And keep in mind, this is their very first operational combat mission. Uh, so they lit emergency locator flares for the aircraft, and the aircraft and Lieutenant Hatton and his crew never found them. So by 2 a.m., after 12 hours of flying, they were over 400 miles away from their base when they ran out of fuel, and the crew parachuted to the ground. The Lady Be Good, the plane itself, uh, flew on for another 16 miles before landing by herself in the desert and crash landing in the Kalashino Sand Sea. And at that point, the crew were never heard from again. They were listed as missing in action, and their, uh, their families were notified according it, it, accordingly. It wasn't until uh, several years later that they were listed or changed their status to killed in action, and Purple Hearts were actually awarded to the crew. <clears throat> So quite a few years later, in 1958, a British uh, petroleum company exploration team looking for oil out in the desert discovered the uh, ruins of the Lady, or the wreck of the Lady Be Good, and alerted the U.S. Air Force about it. So two years later, a joint Air Force and Army exploration team went looking for the crew, and what they found was was honestly heart wrenching, and one of probably the most heart wrenching vignettes, as far as I know, from the uh, Second World War. They found a diary in the pocket of the co-pilot of the plane, and he really detailed their last days. Um, there's been several books written about this and many articles, and it's uh, something that's very poignant and well worth reading about. And basically, once they had uh, parachuted from the plane, they discovered they had one canteen of water to share amongst the entire crew. So they decided they're going to walk north, and they figured they were fairly close to the base at that point. And over the court next eight days, keep in mind this is in the middle of the desert, and eight days they went and crossed, they covered 81 miles, so about 10 miles a day, with one canteen of water that was, they rationed, but they eventually ran out of water. So after, uh, <clears throat> after that time, after 81 miles, they decided to split into several groups to go look for the base. Five of the crew stayed together to include Lieutenant Hatton, and that was where they were found uh, in 1960. To this day, one of the crews still remains unlocated. And so here's the Purple Heart that was earned by William Hatton. And you can see uh, in, the, in the crew picture over on the left-hand side, he's the first one as the lead pilot of the plane. <clears throat> he was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, but grew up in New York. And uh, he attended Francis Xavier High School in Manhattan and gra graduated from Fordham University in 1939. <clears throat> Excuse me. He worked as a salesman in New York City and uh, joined the National Guard as a private in September of 1940. Uh, with the start of the war, he uh, volunteered to become an aviation cadet, and upon a successful completion of flight school, he was commissioned in December 1942. Uh, the mission on April 4th, 1943, was his first operational combat mission. So after he was found, his uh, his body was returned to his family, and he's buried at the Mount St. Mary Cemetery in Queens, New York. Very, very touching story. Next up, we're going to talk about another uh, Army, Air, <coughs> Army aviator who, once again, um, he actually literally sacrificed his life for his crew. 
uh, and in the process uh, died doing it. Frederick uh, Todd was born in Massachusetts, but with his father as a naval aviator, Naval Academy class in 1907, uh, they moved to Long Beach, California, and uh, where he grew up. He joined the Air Army Air Force and was sent overseas on November 11th, 1944, and he served with the 713th Bomb Squadron, 448th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force. So on March 25th, 1945, they flew a bombing mission to Buchen, Germany, and on that mission he was flying a pilot he was flying as the pilot of a B-24J uh, with the name of Eager One. They were over the target there in Germany when they were attacked by four Luftwaffe ME-262 jets. Uh, the jets damaged the upper gun turret, the waist guns, the tail, tail turret, and shot out one engine. So he had three engines, and at that point, he decided there was no way they could return to their base in England. So he made a course for Malmo, Sweden, trying to avoid as many of the heavy flat concentration areas that were <clears throat> going up through northern Germany and Denmark. And they made it to within a mile of the Swedish coast before two of the engines out of the three that were operational began to run wild. Doing everything he could, he held the plane level and allowed the crew to bail out. But unfortunately, as the last one leaving the plane, he didn't make it. His uh, body wasn't found until 51 days later when he washed up on the shore of Sweden. And here is the uh, telegram that was given to his mother by the Western Union uh, that notes that he was in a missing in action status. And uh, she received this on March 2nd, so only, um, only about a week or so after he was actually killed. So one of the things that's interesting about uh, some of these the Purple Hearts, when you come across them and start doing research and, and find out more about them, is you ask questions and you, you wonder why his widow, he obviously had a widow as his, probably as his next of kin, why she didn't actually receive his awards or the Western Union telegrams, but this is something that we'll never know. And this is the second telegram that his mother received. And uh, <clears throat> on May 2nd, 1945, so a week before the end of the war in Europe, um, saying that he was killed on 25th, 25 March 1945, even though he had been previously uh, reported as missing in action. So here are two of the medals that he received posthumously. One was the Silver Star for his heroism, his selfless heroism, sacrificing his own life for the, that of his crew uh, by holding the plane steady and getting the crew out when the, uh, the engines had gone wild a mile off the coast of Sweden. He'd also accumulated enough flight time and uh, combat missions to be awarded three awards of the Air Medal, which you can see on the right-hand side, which was also posthumously awarded to his mother. And here is his Purple Heart. Uh, one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that uh, his mother received from one of the members of his crew was a hand-drawn map that showed where his where the aircraft had gone from the time they were over the target uh, to the time they crashed off the coast of Sweden. So this one is a rather lengthy one, as if some of the other ones hadn't been lengthy before, but uh, this is a story that really not many people know about, but is it's fascinating and um, it's, it's just amazing what happened. Uh, I think it's honestly well worthy of Someone at some point, even writing a, writing a book, <laughs> I thought about it. Anyway, uh, or uh, doing a, uh, making a movie out of this whole event just because of the amazing heroism, uh, just suicidal heroism, honestly, that were shown by these two ships uh, at the beginning of Operation Torch, which is the first invasion that we had of the, in the European theater, but really is not as nearly as well known as D-Day and the Normandy landings. So we have uh, electrician's mate, first class, Stanley Klein. He was from Greaterford, Pennsylvania. He uh, originally enlisted in the Navy in 1927 uh, and was discharged after three years of service. He did his time. Uh, he returned back to Pennsylvania, to Greaterford. He married and uh, worked as an electrician. So the war started and like many prior enlisted uh, personnel, he volunteered out a sense of patriotism to come back on active duty and serve in the Navy again. So he came back in the Navy and uh, they promoted him to electrician's mate first class. And in a un somewhat unusual um, 
course of events, they sent him to a place eventually to U.S. Naval Operating Base 2 in Roseneath, Scotland. This is in, uh, in the summer of 1942. And then the following month, they sent him to a naval base called Poker, which I had to look this up when I was doing my research. Um, this is a secretive Navy base that they basically created for specifically for the upcoming Operation Torch Landings in North Africa. So what he was about to become a part of was something that a naval landing force had never done before. There was 30 men. They were all of the engineering rates in the Navy. And they were being trained as anti-sabotage, uh, members of an anti-sabotage team. So basically the idea was they were going to go into Oran Harbor and they were gonna prevent the French from scuttling their warships in the harbor. So as you can imagine, um, just trying to think through this whole thing, it, it had to have been very daunting in the first place of trying to get on board the French ships to begin with and then trying to prevent people who are wanting to scuttle their ships um, to prevent them from actually stopping scuttling their ships. So uh, it was an idea, but maybe at the time even not a very good one. Definitely a very daring idea. There was a minor problem that they realized. And there was this huge steel boom made of a couple of very heavyweight steel cables that went across the harbor opening there in Oran. And uh, everyone knew that if they just went and just drove a destroyer or drove even a larger ship into these cables, that the damage would be catastrophic. And basically the entire mission would be a failure at that point. Uh, luckily under Lendlease, uh, we had given the, the Royal Navy two Coast Guard cutters that had reinforced bows, and they had been up operating up in the Great Lakes where it was occasionally frozen. They weren't icebreakers, but they were still fairly light, uh, destroyer-sized or small, like destroyer escort-sized ships with reinforced bows that could actually get through these reinforced cables. Now these ships, being former Coast Guard cutters, uh, were very lightly armed and they were the armor on board them was almost non-existent it was it was the coast guard and that was not what they were made to be so these the two ships they were now named the hms heartland and the hms walney <clears throat> contained together with the crews of the ships in addition to those crews about 500 u.s army troops 40 specially trained british sailors for the same mission uh, uh, to, for the anti-sabotage 12, demol 12 demolition experts, and 30 sailors of the anti-scuttling force, of which um, EM-1 was a part of. That anti-scuttling force, by the way, was on board the HMS Heartland. So in the darkness of H hour on November 8, 1942, the two ships with the Walney in the lead and the Heartland behind, uh, they made their run for the heavy cables of the opening of Oran Harbor. And things went bad. Things went really bad at that point. So an alarm sounded in the city, spotlights hit the ships. Basically, they lost the entire element of surprise. The, uh, the, the captain of the Walney decided, <clears throat> decided to go and charge in anyway. And so the two ships went and charged through the opening and went into the harbor. Obviously, this was a it was, a, it was a bad idea, unfortunately. And as brave as it was, it was really brave. They were, they were just really obliterated. The uh, French ships opened fire on them at point blank range and the Heartland received a, a, a round right through her main steam pipe, causing her to come to a complete stop. And so she was just pounded by the uh, French ships that were in the shore batteries that were right there. So fire started burning throughout the entire ship. And so people were running around, just chaos completely ensued on board the Heartland. And, and in the midst of this chaos, uh, you have these the men of the landing party that were in a separate compartment on board the ship. Just at that point in time, there was a 4.7 inch shell. So we're talking a pretty big shell, went right into the compartment and exploded. So not only did you have fire, flame, uh, asphyxiating fumes. You just had utter chaos in this compartment that was already packed to the gills with personnel. So um, e EM1, he just had the presence of mind to be able to go and get through a small scuttle 
and he crawled along the deck um, underneath massive uh, fire from the French ships and found a larger scuttle where he started pulling people out left and right out of this compartment that was on fire. And he was able to rescue 42 men from both the landing party as well as uh, some of the other teams and before he was killed in action. They never saw him again. He was blown over the side. And the next time they found him, uh, he surfaced behind a, a Royal Navy ex fleet auxiliary that was there in Oran Harbor on the 12th of November. Uh, and, the, and the Royal Navy, understanding where he had come from and uh, probably what he had lived through uh, with, you know, true reverence for, for, his, uh, for his body, covered him in the Union Jack and uh, notified the American authorities. So really a very touching, touching story. And, and here's his posthumous Silver Star and Purple Heart they're awarded. They were, they've obviously seen better days, um, but they're no less a testament to his heroism than uh, what you see here. And here's a close-up of his uh, Silver Star. And what the Navy, Navy Department did is they actually hired <clears throat> uh, private engravers in uh, the Washington DC area to engrave their medals. So the engraving is fairly dramatically different from that of the Army. And on the right hand side is the wreckage of the Heartland after she caught on fire and exploded eventually in the harbor. It was devastating. Uh, one last member of the Navy I'd like to talk about is Ensign Robert Glatt. He was, uh, he was from New York and he went to the Webb Institute of Naval Architecture and he joined the Navy in 1941. They sent him to the Cavite Naval Yard in the Philippines. And he was serving as the assistant planning officer where he would plan uh, the maintenance of the ships there in the Navy Yard. As the Japanese attacked that December, his role became ever increasing um, in repairing ships, US ships and submarines that were, had been damaged by Japanese shell fire and bombs as the uh, Japanese invaded the, the Philippines. So eventually he made it to Corregidor <clears throat> where he ended up working for the Army Transportation Service. And uh, he was in charge of repairing boats and barges for transportation of both food, medical supplies, and ammunition around the island of Corregidor. Well, when the island of Corregidor fell, he was taken as a prisoner of war. Many of these prisoners, they survived the Bataan Death March, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And uh, they were taken from the various prison camps in what they called the hell ships. And uh, there's about 134 Japanese merchant vessels that they used to transport 126 Allied prisoners of war, not just Americans, but British and others. And during these voyages, it's estimated about 3,600 Americans perished, and a further 700 who actually made it to Japan to work as slave labor in the Japanese war industry perished just from the effects of the, uh, the voyages there. Because these voyages were were horrible. They were, the prisoners were shoved into the lower holds of the ships where it was hot and there was no sanitary facilities. They received very little, if any, food. And uh, many times there was, they were down there with coal, coal, horse manure, other things that had been transported in these lower holds. And the, the passage from the Philippines to Japan lasted sometimes up to 70 days. So if you can just imagine in just unbelievably 130, 100 and you know, even 140 degree temperatures in the holds of these ships with massive amounts of humidity when they had already been sick and starving to begin with. It was just unfathomable. So Ensign Glatt was loaded onto the hell ship or Yoku Maru on December 13, 1944. <clears throat> and uh, one of the eyewitnesses that last saw him said that he was giving up the very little area that he had around himself and he was fanning the other prisoners to give them more air. When, uh, the ship was attacked by uh, planes from the USS Hornet, so friendly aircraft, uh, on the 15th of December, 1944. Um, during this friendly fire attack, about 270 of the 1,622 prisoners on board the ship perished, to include Ensign Glatt. And this is a, a telegram, uh, postal telegraph, slightly different, but this is one that his parents received when he became uh, was in a prisoner of war status, actually unknown what his actual uh, status was when Corregidor fell. And here are some photos taken by the planes that were attacking from the USS Hornet that were attacking the, uh, the hell ship. 
And if you can see on the right hand side, you see the little white splashes in the water. Those are prisoners who are escaping from the ship. Sadly, many of those prisoners were executed either on the spot or once they got back ashore um, as escaping prisoners by the Japanese. Of the prisoners who did survive, <clears throat> uh, they were eventually loaded onto two, two further additional hell ships and a total of only 403 actually made it to Japan. The rest died on the way either from friendly fire, from exhaustion, from starvation, or from disease. Here are his posthumous awards. One thing that's really interesting about these is number one, you'll, you'll see that the, the Navy engraving changed over time from the earlier one that I just talked about, but also that his uh, Bronze Star Medal was awarded by the Army. And this is awarded for his work with the Army Transportation Service. And it's engraved in the way that the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot engraved the medals at the time. And here is his Purple Heart Certificate that was received by his family in August 1945. And then here is his presidential accolade. And as I had mentioned before, it's a little bit more, the Navy ones had a little bit more detail to them. And like it says, as if you can read it, it says at sea in the Asiatic area aboard a Japanese prisoner of warship. And here are the documents that came with the, uh, the Bronze Star Medal. What's interesting about this is that it took quite a while for the heroism that a lot of these prisoners of war demonstrated uh, to actually get out through investigations and, and so on. And so this one is actually that uh, Glatt's mother didn't receive this Bronze Star until May of 1947, quite a, quite a long time after the end of the war and quite a, quite a while after he died. On to the Marine Corps. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a couple of, uh, couple of Marines here for a minute. And uh, this fellow, well, first off, I'll say that the, the final battle of uh, the Marshall Islands was on Perry Island, uh, which a lot of people have never heard of the Battle of Perry Island because there was, it was, took place on February 22nd, 1944, and it was secured the following day. So it was a one-day battle, and 73 Marines died. Um, Corporal Walter McKay was one of the, the 73 Marines that were killed during the battle. He was a radio operator with Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 22nd Marines and uh, he was mortally wounded during the landings and posthumously awarded the Navy Cross. And here is his posthumous Navy Cross and his uh, per posthumous Purple Heart that he earned during, uh, during his time there on Perry Island. Talk about one more Marine, um, and this guy, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, probably shouldn't refer to him as this guy, but Lieutenant Colonel Schultz, here he is seeing this picture. Um, he was with his battalion staff. He was from Winona, Minnesota, but grew up in Corvallis, Oregon, and attended uh, Oregon State College lettering and football, graduating in 1936. He initially served in China, but then came back um, before the beginning of the war and was a company commander for an officer candidate company, and before returning to the fleet in 1943. So, uh, he became the executive officer of the 1st Battalion, 24th Marines, in October of 1943. And he, their first combat action was on Roy Namor, which was another very brief uh, action. Uh, his uh, battalion commander was killed during that action, and he took command of the battalion. <clears throat> so his first invasion as a battalion commander was that of Saipan. And uh, his battalion landed shortly after the initial assault battalions on June 15th. Uh, on June 16th, uh, during a very heavy and accurate artillery barrage, the, the uh, regimental commander, Colonel Hart, called a meeting of the battalion commanders. So Colonel Hart met with the battalion commanders in a dugout that was near the regimental, near the regimental headquarters. And uh, unfortunately, the Japanese artillery was simply too accurate. And uh, Colonel Schultz was killed by a piece of shrapnel. He was killed instantly. At the time, he was 30 years old. For his leadership on both Roy No More and in Saipan, he earned a Legion of Merit, which can be seen here, and the Purple Heart. And I've talked about you know, formal presentation ceremonies, and this is uh, Colonel Schultz's widow receiving the Legion of Merit in a formal presentation ceremony <clears throat> from Major General Earl Long. 
And in any war, there are going to be very poignant stories, as I've already discussed quite a few. Um, but in this one, really, well, in any war, really, when you have multiple members of the same family that are killed, it's something that just, it's really tragic and devastating to, and even more so, because it expands to so many more people that are just devastated by their loss. And um, I actually wrote a chapter about families and family losses in my book, but because of <clears throat> the Army uh, Historical Center and the, uh, the, the audience for this webinar, I thought this would be a very appropriate one to showcase. And these medals belong to Lieutenant General Leslie McNair, who you may have heard about. They, they named an Army base after him. Um, anyway, the, uh, these are the awards that he earned. He earned the uh, Distinguished Service Medal in World War I. <clears throat> and then in North Africa, he was wounded in action and received the uh, Purple Heart that was in the upper right-hand uh, part of the screen. The center one was the one that his widow was given posthumously after he was killed in action by friendly fire. And here's a close-up of the engraving uh, on his posthumous Purple Heart. It's a little bit different than the normal Army engraving, and uh, we assume it's because of the fact that it was probably done by a private engraver somewhere in the Washington, D.C. area, much like the Navy and Marine Corps awards at the time, just due to his stature and uh, due to the high visibility of his loss. You'll see over on the left-hand side is an AP uh, photo of him wearing his Purple Heart that he received for Wounds in Action in North Africa. And that is the exact same Purple Heart as the one on the previous slide that he'd received. And here's a couple of letters. Uh, you, may, you may recognize the authors, uh, President Roosevelt and future President Harry Truman. <clears throat> just to Mrs., uh, Mrs. McNair, expressing their regret and just over the tragedy of the loss, not only of her husband, but of the loss of her son as well as Colonel McNair. Uh, General McNair's son was killed in action only a few short weeks after he was killed. Unfortunately, the medal whereabouts of Colonel McNair's medals are unknown to this day. So now I'm going to go and, and talk just a few minutes about <clears throat> different engraving styles and if you were to ever run across a Purple Heart, what you might see on the back of a Purple Heart. So these are all examples of Army styles of engraving. Um, the first two, um, up in the upper left-hand corner, to Robert Johnson and William Shaner are hand engraved ones, which were the majority of Army Purple Hearts of the Second World War. Uh, just as a as a as a note, William Shaner was actually killed 76 years ago, as of tomorrow, uh, on October 1st. So very very kind of poignant there. Uh, Bernard Brown is uh, what we call a small machine engraved where they use a pantograph machine and using this pantograph machine they were able to engrave in fairly small letters of it very nicely the name of the casualty on the back of the purple heart. <clears throat> Jay Gorman has a slightly larger lettering which is called a large machine engraved but was also used with a pantograph machine and all of these were done by the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot. Harold Stricker, it may be hard for you to see on the screen there because they're hard to see even in person. And for a very few short months uh, in the summer of 1944, the Army went to stamping the names of the, of the casualties on the back of the Purple Hearts. Um, this was proved to be, number one, really not aesthetically pleasing and really not honoring to the, the sacrifices that were being made by these the men and women who were receiving these. But... Uh, it was also, well, really hard to photograph, but those are for folks who write books. Anyway, on the bottom right-hand side, you've got what's called the, uh, the script engraved Purple Heart, which these are most often found for folks who were <clears throat> initially listed as missing in action, but later on in 1947, 48, and 49, were finally determined to be killed in action, and uh, as their status has changed, Purple Hearts are awarded to their next of kin in the style of uh, the more of a flowing hand-done style. You'll see a little flourish. Uh, Keith Whites, he was in the Army Air Force, and a lot of times you'll see a little flourish that was done at the description discretion of the engraver, and that has like a little winged prop at the bottom. 
Here are some different versions of Navy engraving. Um, in the very beginning, for a few short weeks even, the Navy started engraving uh, Purple Hearts with not only the name, the rate, and the rank, but also the date of death of the casualty. This proved to be far too expensive as well as just overly cumbersome. A lot of times it just wouldn't fit. So they switched to a, a just as beautiful, but not as thorough style as seen in Edwin Janney and Charles Heidenrich. Later on in the war, they switched to a, a more blocky style, as can be seen by Walter McCune and uh, Chief Radio Electrician Leonard Woods, and both of these are from 1945. So, and then Paul Harvey, much like the, uh, the script engraved ones of the Army, these were used as, or are very often seen as ones awarded to members of a crew of submarines and other ships that had been listed initially as missing in action and later on in later years after the war were uh, finally listed as killed in action and these were awarded to the uh, next to kin. This engraving style actually also went through the Korean War as well. Final slide of engraving styles. <clears throat> we have uh, three different kinds of Marine Corps engraving and you can see how it changed over the course of the, of the uh, of the war from a fancier style to a less fancy style. Um, and then there's two different kinds of Coast Guard engraving. And once again, you can see how it's, it kind of changed and evolved over time. Uh, the final one on the bottom right is a wounded in action Purple Heart because, and I include this to show that not every named Purple Heart is actually a posthumous one. Oftentimes people would receive uh, wounded in action ones when they were in the hospital or whatever, and they would later go and have them privately engraved, just as uh, First Lieutenant Harold Larson did. Just a quick note, not everyone who died during the war received a Purple Heart, even if they were in a combat zone. Um, Charles Skinner received that, uh, the posthumous uh, Soldier's Medal that's in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, he was a captain who was a medical doctor who was overseeing an exercise in West Virginia and a soldier fell into a, a icy river and he jumped in to save him and unfortunately passed away. And Lieutenant Fonda in the lower right, he went in to save a couple of his sailors that had gone into a space uh, on board a ship that had asphyxiating fumes and was just like his sailors overcome by the fumes and died instantly, but he was awarded the Navy Marine Corps Medal for his attempt at saving his sailors. I'm working on volume two of the book, and the volume two will go and be the Korean War, uh, Vietnam War, the Gulf War, and all the way up until the Global War on Terror. And I just wanted to include a few just so you could see the differences in graving style. David Herr uh, earned the Distinguished Service Cross posthumously, as well as a Purple Heart while fighting in Korea. And this is a style of engraving that went all the way through the Vietnam War and all the way up into the 1980s for both, <clears throat> excuse me, the Army and the Air Force who adopted it partway through the uh, Vietnam War. Jimmy Hawes, uh, he was one of the very few casualties of the first Gulf War. And uh, he was a, uh, in a Vulcan uh, fighting vehicle and was killed on the 20th of February of 1991. So, um, this is a very different style of engraving uh, that's much more of a serif style of engraving um, rather than the, the plain machine engraving that was seen from earlier Purple Hearts. And finally, from the Global War on Terror, First Lieutenant Darren Hidalgo, uh, he was killed in action on the 20th of February of 2011 in the Kandahar province when his uh, insurgents attacked his unit with an IED. And, uh, he was a 2009 West Point graduate. So as following in a long line of uh, West Point graduates, his father was a West Point graduate, as was his brother. And just very quickly, because I know I'm <clears throat> kind of over the designated time at this point, but I'd like to talk to the casualty process and just show you a few pictures of how it worked, because there was all, one side was the metals and one side was the actual human side of how the casualties were processed, which is something that's really interesting in and of itself. So the casualties would be gathered together in a central station and their, their personal items would be inventoried and those would be sent back to the states to be finally given to the next of kin. And then the casualties would then be buried in temporary burial locations wherever 
fairly close to where they fell, This, in this case, on the uh, black sands of Iwo Jima. Uh, the notifications that someone had died, uh, those were then sent to the uh, casualty branch <clears throat> that run by the Army or the War Department, and those were logged in, and uh, that's what kind of set off the whole process for sending out the telegram, et cetera. One of the things that I pointed out earlier on was the uh, return to sender mail, and the War Department would go through all the letters that were marked return to sender to make sure that they matched up with casualty notifications so that a next of kin would not receive a return to sender letter prior to being officially notified by the War Department. Then the uh, telegrams were typed up and they were approved and sent out by Western Union. And the most horrible job probably in several wars was being the Western Union messenger boy, having to knock on the door to uh, tell a family that their loved one had either been killed or was missing in action. Just a horrible job. And you can see the, the Western Union telegram letter in his, uh, in his hand there. <clears throat> and here's an image of the Western Union telegram. And it was going to a Mr. Jack Johnson who lost uh, actually both of his sons during the war, one in a flight accident in the States and the other one over over Italy in December of 1943. <clears throat> there was a ton of correspondence that happened after uh, the notification. We're talking about everything from life insurance benefits to, uh, you know, burial locations to many, many, many questions that the families had as far as how their loved ones were lost, um, different specific items that were on them, you know, pens, rings, things like that. And so all of those had to be answered by many, many people sitting in desks like these there at the War Department. Finally, from 1946 to 1951, the government uh, conducted the process of repatriation where they brought back 171,000 casualties um, to the United States from many, just from hundreds of different locations all over the world. And a further 90,000 were relocated from temporal, temporary burial locations to permanent burial locations overseas, where to this day, they are still administered by the American Battlefield Monuments Commission. And with that, that concludes my webinar. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed it, and I sincerely hope that your appreciation of the medal and of what it represents, just the ultimate sacrifice, and just, you know, the unspeakable, um, tragedy that families experience, what it represents, and, and just I hope that that has increased by spending the last hour and 10 minutes with me. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, we do have a couple questions. Uh, the first one uh, asked about the heraldry on the Purple Heart. What does all those symbols mean? Oh, Lord. <laughs> We're going to be here for a, for a while, but uh, <clears throat> okay, I'll take a stab at this because I was completely not prepared for this question. Okay. But uh, obviously you have the head of George Washington, which is right there in gilt on the front. And then that is on top of a, uh, a either plastic or a enameled uh, Purple Heart uh, center. And then of course that's on top of the actual planchet. The crest above the, uh, the head of George Washington is the Washington family coat of arms. And then I've got a I've got a phone a friend on what the uh, the green ferns mean, and I have two experts here with me who are both shrugging right now. Okay, <laughs> I wish I could tell you. Um, just one thing on on the cover of the book that's visible right now. That's a gold star pin, which I didn't cover in this seminar, which basically is worn by the family, the next of kin of someone who's killed in action, and. Um, is kind of a ubiquitous sign of someone who was lost in combat from World War II to the present day. Uh, you talked about some of the POW ships that were sunk, because um, there were many. I mean, uh, one had uh, over 1,700 POWs lost their lives. Yes. How did they document the fact that they were POWs and, and were lost in that manner? <sighs> wow. Um, there... <laughs> I tell you what, when I was researching that, because I, I have a part of a chapter about, actually I have a full chapter about prisoners of war, and part of that chapter is about the hell ships. And uh, I will say that it's one of the most fascinating um, rabbit trails to go down. And I, rabbit trail sounds horrible, but just the amount of information that is out there 
on the internet that is just readily available about the deaths on the hell ship and about the POW experience and the amount of actual original documentation from not only the US archives, but also from Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and other governments. Um, it's fascinating to read through. And a lot of times these, uh, <clears throat> where these lists came from of who was on what ship, because even at the time of, of the death, they didn't really know who was on the ship until considerable time later. A lot of those, a lot of that information came from manifests that were out of the memories of the surviving prisoners of war. And then of course, captured Japanese manifests, which from time to time were sometimes correct and sometimes incorrect as well. So um, I, I would encourage whoever asked that question, you can literally spend months uh, reading about the experience of the, of the Japanese uh, hell ships. And it's, Truly, truly fascinating. Um, oh, and we just found out, this is what I get for phoning a friend, from the Institute of Heraldry, the Washington coat of arms between sprays and green leaves. That's, okay. what, that's what it means. Well, that's part of Washington's uh, uh, family seal then. Correct, yes. Um, you, you talk largely of those who uh, receive the awards posthumously. Do they engrave uh, wounded soldiers, marine, airmen today, or is that uh, not, not done? So, no, I, I have personally never seen one for a wounded in action member today um, that has been engraved with a name. Um, and even right now, the Navy and Marine Corps do not engrave posthumous Purple Hearts. Um, the Marine Corps stopped in 1969, and then the Navy stopped sometime in the 1980s, 80s or 1990s, uh, but I have not seen either of them engraved uh, for people, for Marines or Naval personnel who were killed in the global war on terror. Uh, let's say somebody um, finds one of these the medals that is engraved. What should they do with it? Swap me. Well, you know, and sorry, go ahead. And a swap me or say an answer. Well, um, there, there's quite a few, there are quite a few people out there who uh, there are several very active groups on Facebook, um, you know, that you can contact people. I mean, people can go on my website. People can, you know, contact quite a few uh, organizations that can help them identify uh, who that person was. And they can also go just a simple Google search, especially if someone's being cared for by the American Battlefield Monuments Commission. All of their information is right there online and just type in the name and it'll pop right up. If they have subscriptions to Fold3 or Ancestry, it's, uh, it's even easier than that. So those are things they can do. And then once they find out you know, who it belonged to, then it's a matter of that, at that point, if they wanna go and you know, track down a member of the family to return it, which is a, a very honorable thing to do, or if they want to um, offer it to a, a, an appropriate museum or you know, offer it to someone who is a collector or researcher, and then it's up to them at that point for what, the, the, what, what they consider to be the right thing. Do you have any sense of how many uh, Purple Hearts have been awarded since the begin, both posthumously and, and, and regularly? Oh, uh, um, I've seen figures and I've seen figures always annotated by no one really knows for sure. But the figures I've seen are anywhere between 1.2 and 1.7 million Purple Hearts. Okay. Anything Both else? wounded in action and posthumous. Anything else, you have, anything else you'd like to add? Oh, for me, it, honestly, this was, this, putting this book together was an, both an honor and a privilege. Um, and being able to document a lot of these guys who were quite honestly, uh, been forgotten about over time. Uh, as their families died off, their parents died, uh, re you know, sole remaining children passed away. And uh, being able to go and, and honor them by writing about them and researching them and you know, putting them between the pages of a hardcover book so that way many people can read about them and remember them, that to me was probably one of the greatest privileges I'll ever have. Well, the, the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, its, its purpose is to tell the Army story one soldier at a time. We don't always get those stories from the soldier. What you've done with this book is really to capture some of those stories that have been lost, uh, and, but now they'll be preserved for generations. So thank you for what you're doing and thank you for continuing on the next book. Thank and, you. Uh, 